Welcome to Protective Adaptations number one, the first in a series. Woohoo! All right, so today what we're going to talk about is protective adaptations um, that animals have, and that includes mimicry, camouflage, beak type, migration, hibernation. Oh, this is going to be exciting. I love this stuff. All right, so the physical adaptations of animals. We know that animals inhabit a whole variety of environments all over the world. And each type of animal has traits that help it live in that particular environment. And these traits, or these what we call adaptations, improve an animal's chances of survival, um, for survival and reproduction. And survival and reproduction are the keys. There, they have to be able to survive and reproduce, not just survive. Okay, so I just love this. Okay, so physical adaptations in harsh environments. Look at these, just crazy. Look at those teeth. Let me just put this on here for you for a minute so you can see this adaptation that we saw in Finding Nemo. I see a light. A light? Yeah, over there. Hey, Conscience, am I dead? Oh, I, I, I see it too. is a big deal for me. I want to touch it. Oh. Hey, come back. <laughs> come on back here. I'm going to get you. 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 I'm going to be your best friend. Good feelings gone. Okay. So, you can see, um, whoa. All right, let's see how we can see. There we go. Whew. Okay, so obviously an adaptation here is that this fish, is the anglerfish, has developed a light. When you're in the deep sea, there's no light down there. And so you can even hear, you know, um, the, it's not Nemo, his dad, Nemo's dad, saying, um, I'm feeling happy. Well, we know that uh, light causes us to feel happier. And so, um, but when they saw the teeth, mm, not so much happiness anymore. Okay, so these adaptations increase survival. They're supposed to. So what we have is within a population, individuals can show variations of the same trait. Look around the room at us. We all have different variations of our same traits. We're different heights, we're different weights, we have different hair type, hair color. Uh, different athleticism, different intelligences. There's all kinds of things that we have no control over. Some things we have control over, like whether or not you study, uh, how much time you spend studying, but some things we have no control over, and those are just variations that exist. And so these variations are due to sexual reproduction, and then it could be possible random mutation, or it could be a display of some pre-planned genetic options. There could, everything could be already pre-planned on the DNA, and then what ends up showing up is what, what trait is needed for that particular species or for that particular area. Um, and most of these variations, they either have no effect or have a negative effect on an animal's, uh, uh, an organism's chance for survival. Obviously, they're going to pass the favorable variation down to their offspring because if it's negative, they're not going to survive to reproduce. If it's positive, then they'll survive to reproduce. And their chances of passing that along, think back to your Punnett squares, the chances of passing that along are much greater because they're passing it along and um, the because they survived to reproduce. This particular adaptation then becomes more common in the population and then over time that that population changes and so because it's more advantageous to it over time it's going to change all right let me give you an example here okay so looking at this slide if you're if these dark mice are on the dark background here it's going to be way easier for that 
bird to come by and find the white mice. So you can see over here what's picked off, the white mouse. What's picked off over here? Almost all the white mice are gone. The, the dark mice are still there because it's in this case, it's not very favorable to be a white mouse. Okay. So an animal's adaptations can be structural or they can be behavioral. So it's not just physical adaptations, but it can be the way that, you know, I mean, think about it. Same thing with, if we're, if we're talking about humans, it's not just the physical adaptations, but behavioral. Can you sing good? Can you draw well? Can you jump high? So those behavioral, um, uh, uh, adaptations you can have those as well can you um, do you have a positive attitude can you push through when you need to push through instead of giving up those are all behavioral adaptations structural adaptations are the physical ones or the structures that help make an animal suited to a particular environment so if they can jump higher if they're stronger if they're faster uh, then that can certainly help them now, it's not always bigger is better, though. We think that way, but sometimes big's not always the best because if you're the biggest, it may, be, it may take more to maintain you in the environment. It may be harder for you to find uh, camouflage or to find a place of cover. So don't think in that mindset that bigger is better. All right, now also the shape of a bird's beak, for example, is a structural adaptation that allows it to eat specific kinds of foods and we're actually going to do a lab related to that where you'll really understand this bird beak and the effect it's really a fun lab but let's take a look so these this beak right here we're looking at darwin's finches and so darwin did a tremendous amount of research um, he looked at all these different finches they were still finches but they have these different beaks and what he noticed in his research is that the beaks correlated to what they ate. This makes sense. So this particular finch eats leaves. This one eats seeds because it's got to be able to crack down hard on that outer covering. So it's got to have a strong beak. This one is eating buds or fruit. See this tearing part right here? It's got to be able to rip open the skin of the fruit. This one's eating grubs, so it's digging in the ground in order to get those bugs out of there. This is a tool-using finch. It actually uh, uses different tools in order to get its food. This one's eating insects, so it's got a little beak because it's got, you know, it doesn't want to have some big, long beak where it's hard for it to get to the insects. All right, physical adaptations. These chickens have short, pointed beaks that pick up the insects and the seeds well from the ground. These filter feeders like a duck, they have broad flattened beaks. Their beaks are like a sieve. And so it's like it filters um, like a mini colander inside its mouth and it filters out its food from the water. So the water just flows through it and it filters the food out from that. Woodpeckers have these long pointed beaks because they're gonna make holes in the trees and find the insects. Hummingbirds have these long curved beaks that let them drink nectar from flowers. So here is a great, um, a great chart. What I want you to do is I want you to write this chart. If you're taking notes, I want you to make sure you have this. If you're writing answers, you're going to write this chart. Make sure you put this and draw a picture of these beaks here. All right, so adapting to their environment, the sea urchin, they have all these little spiny things. They have the sharp needle-like spines. That's gonna intimidate a predator. It helps them survive. If they didn't have it, if something comes by and wants to eat it, it's like, oh, yuck, look at that. I'm not eating that. It looks like it hurts. The viceroy, they have this concept of mimicry. And so they look like, they're not poisonous, but they look like they're poisonous um, uh, relative here so because they look like a poisonous butterfly other animals aren't going to eat it the cheetah its adaptation is that it can run really fast which helps it avoid predators or it runs really fast to catch its prey look at those muscles aren't they fabulous all right the polar bear the adaptation is that it either has this thick blubber so it's got all this fat on it to keep it warm it also has this white coat, and that coat changes with the season. 
peacocks and other birds, the males have these very beautiful bright colors. So this is the male cardinal, here's the female cardinal. She's plain, she's just looking for the, the pretty ones. And here's a male peacock. Again, the females are very plain. This is quite a display when the males are doing their little mating dance. They're shaking these, these beautiful feathers all over. It's pretty intimidating. All right, deep sea, you have this bioluminescence. So you have this lumen, okay, means light. Bio means life. So these are, there's a living bacteria in here that will allow this animal to, um, to, sh to shine. Well, that's a pretty big deal in the deep ocean because there's no light. So if suddenly now you have light, just like with Nemo, ah, they almost got eaten. Well, Nemo's dad. All right, so mimicry, let's take a look at this. So they will mimic, animals will mimic, they'll look like another animal. So here you have, in mimicry, you can have your walking stick. Oh, I love walking sticks, they're just the coolest. All right, but they'll look like a stick. You can barely even see that one there. And unless it moves, you don't see it. Um, other animals, um, you can have ones that closely resemble another animal, so they'll mimic looking like another one. Um, potential predators, they can't distinguish between the two types of the insects. They can't tell which one's which, so I'm not going near either one. So here is the wasp versus the hoverfly. You can see they look very similar. So if you're just an animal that's looking at, at uh, um, eating it, Think again, it's like, oh, I could get stung, I'm not eating that one. It doesn't occur only in insects. You can see these snakes here. You have the venomous coral snake, eastern coral, and then the king snake is non-venomous. This special little saying here, red touch yellow. So if the red touches the yellow, kill a fellow. That means it's venomous. Red touch black, friend of jack. So if the red is touching the jack, it's non-venomous. My advice to you, if you see a snake, Get out of there. Don't, don't, let's see, what was that saying? I can't remember, is this one okay? Is it not? Just get out of there. All right, camouflage. Camouflage is another type of physical adaptation. It allows them to be able to conceal themselves in here. You can barely see that toad in there. That frog blends in with that flower. That fish, you can see the fish in there, but you really can't see it well. Tiger is an example. Its stripes help it blend into its environment, so you can barely see it. This one's a good one. Yeah, I mean, you're not really gonna be able to see that tiger in there. It camouflages it. Whoops, I'm not really sure what's happening there. All right, so some of them will even change their coloration um, in order to provide better camouflage. So they're gonna have a brown coat in the summer and a white coat in the winter. The Arctic fox, here's the Arctic hare, changing its colors, the collared lemming, the ermine. All right, then of course we have physical defenses, chemical and physical defenses. Mr. Skunk uses the chemical defense. The squid uses ink, so when it's when it's threatened, it releases ink from its uh, when it releases ink from its body. The porcupine has the physical spines there. You don't ever want to get close to those those quills. It'll shoot them out, and they're really really hard to remove. All right, so uh, I want you to go to the. Um, I want you to go to my website and pull up the PowerPoint. There's this discussion question. I want you to watch this video here and answer these questions right here. And then you'll see this picture here of the peppered moths. You can see how they blend in. I want you to answer this question, this one, and then this one on your paper. That's all we have for today. Have a marvelous time. Be good. Wear your seatbelt.